Hey everyone, welcome to the Sanctus Forum, the broadcasting side of the Sanctus Institute. Um, check out more about that in the description below. But uh, today we're back with more on uh, great books or whatever this thing series is going to be called. I haven't even named it yet. This time we're talking about the Brothers Karamazov um, by Fedor Dostoevsky. I still don't actually know how to pronounce the word Karamazov, Karamazov. Um, if there are more intelligent people um, watching this, uh, let us know. I am here with um, my good friend from England, Rowan Williams. No, it's Mark <laughs> Williamson. <laughs> Even better than Rowan Williams. I don't quite have the same beard or eyebrows. Yes, you need to you need to work on that, and to learn Russian, like he yeah. apparently uh, speaks. Does he? A... Wow. Okay. Like yeah, yeah. Sure yeah as does. far as I know, he's he's um... amongst no doubt several other languages. Yes. Yeah. No. He's a he's a bright guy. Um, <laughs> So, uh, but um, I'm, I'm very happy to, to be back with uh, Mark. And we have, if you haven't seen the other videos, um, they uh, should be around here somewhere, certainly on the channel. Um, go check those out first. I assume uh, that now you have your copy of the Brothers Karamazov. Um, if you don't, it's fine. But, and it'd be great if you'd actually even read a little bit. Um, but uh, it's okay. Um, still, still like the video and subscribe because we just uh, definitely need the the help here. Um, anyway, we're talking about Christian themes and being humble and not trying to get people to subscribe to your video. Um, and uh, Mark was um, off camera, um, reminding me. I don't know if I actually knew it about uh, Dostoevsky's background, um, his his biography, and uh, I think that'd be a great way to start today. Yeah, so because we talked about how this novel is kind of set in Dostoevsky's career, or he's rejected all of the um, Western philosophy and uh, let's have a revolution, and has ended up with this profoundly yeah. Christian, Orthodox Christian position on Jesus is the answer. But it's interesting that his autobiography must have played a huge part in that. So as a young guy, he um, wrote a novel, was it Poor Folk, that was wildly popular and kind of he got caught up in the academic and the literary circles of the time in Russian society, um, which were very kind of... Um, left-leading and we need to have a communist revolution we need to change society and we'll use violence to do that and because he was a good writer they gave him the printing press and said right start writing for us and he started churning out a few pamphlets and I think there's a bit of a discussion as to how much he believed in this you know is it he's, he was a young guy who was certainly starstruck by he's now hanging out with these literary critics and authors that before he'd only just you know read about but he's becoming a bit of a mouthpiece for the revolution. They all get arrested. They're put on trial. They're convicted. He's actually convicted to death. And um, he goes through a mock execution. I think they, they put them in rows of eight people. And he was on the second row of eight. So he wasn't actually on the you know, on the scaffold or whatever, um, about to be shot. But that first row of eight were there. They were blindfolded. In fact, I think... They went through with firing, but they were firing blanks. And at that point, then um, there was kind of this um, notice that, no, okay, the courts decided to have clemency and you're not going to be executed. The conviction is commuted down to exile in Siberia and hard labor. So he wasn't the guy on the stage who was, you know, being fired at, but he was next in line and thought, I've got 30 seconds left to live. You know, yeah. and then ends up instead of being executed, going to Siberia for eight years of hard labor, and that had 
Like the the mock execution must have had a huge impact on him and realizing, wow, I'm not going to die. Now, what do I do with my life? But being in Siberia, apparently being alongside the poorest, you know, the the non-educated Russian peasants there made him realize this whole revolution thing isn't going to work. It's not going to change society for the better because it's not going to help these people that I'm alongside here. It's not going to help the poor and the illiterate. Yeah. What is going to? And that's why he, you know, went on this journey of realizing Christianity, Jesus, is the hope for these people. Um, and and that's what's going to be real. That's what's going to change society. And so then he came back from the exile and started writing again. And that's why people often get confused because it's like, well, hang on, this guy was originally the firebrand talking about revolution. And now he's become almost the traditionalist, the staunch mm. conservative talking about family values and talking about Christianity. And he did go a 180 degree change, I guess, in his mm. politics. Mm -hmm. Um but it was because, well, how much was it because of the conviction and the execution? In his writing, he talks more about it's, it's being in Siberia alongside the poor, realizing Jesus is the answer that these people need, not yeah. a change in government. Um, it's interesting, a book like this, that uh, to give it the title Christian Literature, because in, in our day, that usually is a symbol hmm. of not very well written. Um, yes, that's synonymous with poor quality. Isn't poor quality, it, yes. And, the, <laughs> and there, there are there are some good ones uh, that are do deal with Christian themes and uh, are novels and are not poor quality. Um, there are certainly a lot that are <laughs> that fit that description. Um, but it, but it's very, it's very obvious in in a book like this um what so let's assume people are reading this for the first time or maybe reading it again what are some things that people should look for keep an eye out for as they look through and are trying to get a sense of the 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 spirituality hmm. of the book so in terms of the Christian themes, it's really interesting. A couple of hundred pages in, you have the famous discussion between Alyosha and Ivan, um, where he introduces this character called the Grand Inquisitor. And it almost is the big critique of Christianity that comes out from Ivan, which in, if, in effect comes down to the suffering argument. You know, if God is good, how can there be so much suffering in the world? And Ivan gives... Uh, you know, horrific catalog of some of the suffering that does take place. And Alyosha is trying to respond to that um, and doesn't really have an adequate response. Just says, you know, in effect, well, and Jesus suffered also um, is kind of where it's left. But Dostoevsky was really keen not to make it just two theologians or philosophers arguing. So then you have a bit of an answer to Evan's intellectual arguments with the teachings of Father Zosima that you talked about last time and him bringing in um, something of an answer. And Dostoevsky apparently wrestled in his notes when he was writing this. Of, I don't feel like this is an adequate enough intellectual answer to all of the critiques that Ivan has brought. Because it's probably not. And, you know, if it was, we wouldn't be asking the question now, well, where is God in the suffering? Why is there so much suffering in the world? It's still a question that the church wrestles with. But then I think the rest of the novel becomes Alyosha especially, outworking that, following on his father's teachings of, well, love people, even when they don't deserve it, extend grace to people. And that, to me, is the amazing Christian theme coming through. This idea that, if we extend grace to others when they don't deserve it, maybe especially when they don't deserve it, yeah. that's how we transform individuals and society. People are changed when they encounter that grace. Um, yeah. We tend to, we need to receive that grace from God to be able to then pass it on to others. No. Yeah. Was there, was there a particular moment of the book or a, a, a story or a particular theme that that 
was important to you when you first read it? Hmm. Yeah, important to me. The the story of the onion is because uh-huh. um, certainly Dostoevsky said that it was the kernel of that spirituality, and so now I suppose it's become that for me. Well, and actually, the the epigram for the novel is from John's Gospel. You know, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. And um, that's always been a profound verse for me, that sense of, you know, so often the kingdom is furthered by us sacrificing and putting to death our own, certainly, sinful desires, but even some of our godly desires, choosing to to bury it in the ground and see what God does with that. Is he going to... That's terrible, isn't it? I don't mean bury it in the ground in the way of, like, the parable of the talents. No, but mm-hmm. when God has given us something, often there is this um, spiritual thing, I suppose, lay it on the altar is more the classic Christian image, and see whether God enables that to flourish or not. You know, what is yeah. going to grow from it? And I think that's what the epigram is pointing us to that the novel is about. And that's what this... This little um, passage called The Onion is the the key thing that confirms Alyosha in this ministry, I guess, of extending grace to others. And so the story of The Onion is, um, and it's kind of a legend that he took from Russian folklore of a wicked woman who um, had died and was in torment in hell and her good angel you know, is kind of going to God and trying to intercede on her behalf, saying, you know, can can we do anything for this woman? And God says to the angel, did the woman do anything good in her life? Everyone knew that she was wicked. Is there one, even just one good deed? Yeah. And the woman, the angel, sorry, says, yes, one time she dug up an onion from her, was it her own backyard, and she gave it to a poor beggar basically. And that was the one good deed. And so God says to the angel, okay, take that very same onion that she gave someone else and kind of extend it down to her in hell, in the lake of fire, and see if you can draw her up with that onion. So the angel does, takes the onion, throws it, I guess, down into the chasm, and the woman grabs it and is being pulled up but then all the other people in hell see that she is being dragged up. And they're like, oh, we want to come as well. Grab onto her legs. And then the weight of it forces the onion to break. And she yeah. falls down there. And <laughs> in, in a way, theologically, I have so many questions with that. I mean, that that's, that's not true theology. That's not grace. That's still a yeah. works-based salvation. Yeah, of, don't count well, on so, you know, You know, yeah, so if there's one good thing that you've done, that's enough to save you. No, the good news is even better than that. Even if you've yeah. done no good thing, all you need yeah. to do is believe in Jesus yeah. and you are saved, you know. Yeah. But the it becomes this metaphor throughout the book, I guess, and Alyosha uses it as kind of this thing of, I need to extend onions. I need to extend grace to others. Yeah. And by doing that, you do see in the novel people being drawn out of the evil that they yeah. are doing and being transformed and having that redemption, um, the transformation of the individual. Um, yeah. And them in turn, then, and this is where it gets amazing, I suppose exciting for me maybe, them in turn offering onions extending grace to others and seeing that transformation so the you know it becomes exponential in the ripple effect it's not just Alyosha trying to follow Jesus and live a good life by the end there are other characters who because he has extended onions to them they have started extending onions to others Um, Yeah. yeah but it's all they're transformed by encountering love and actually, then there's a, a there's a I suppose a subset of that of they recognise their own guilt and their own responsibility um, for stuff, and that transforms them, and they start in turn extending onions, love, self sacrifice to others, yeah. and seeing people one by one being changed. It's an incredible picture. Yeah. yeah. Right, and that's that really was Dostoevsky's vision for how Russian society could be improved mm-hmm. um, and move past its sort of the, all the tensions in it was was that simple 
the simple acts of, of kindness and grace, mercy to people who don't deserve it. Uh, yeah. I don't... I, the main character, Ayosha, um, certainly the one you will identify with the most. Um, I would not want to have his family. I had a, I had a much better family. <laughs> than than he has and 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 that's that's a gift of god um but it is um whether regardless of where god has placed us in our lives uh in in his in his world um the people he's put us with we often don't get to choose that and Mm. um I, i like the the the, I don't know if it's a, a transformation in the book, but at the beginning, as I've, as I've already said, Alyosha is wanting to go into the monastery. Um, so he, if you can picture him, he's wearing kind of a monk's clothing uh, throughout the whole um, novel. And he's, um, and yet he, at this point in his, at least the way that this monastery works, he's still leaving the monastery a lot and working with his family and going to visit this brother and that brother and that, you know, his father. And, um, for me, when I first read this, and I hope this is an encouragement to other people, I did not want to be where God had placed me in life. Hmm. And I did not want to have to deal with the people that I um, was dealing with. I just, I just had better, better plans for my life. And, um, and to see a character like this uh, accepting his vocation, um, not specifically to the monastery, but as a brother and son within this family and just trying to be kind, be helpful, um, push people in the right direction. And the word I always use for him is that he's just floating like other people dictate his schedule and he has to deal with this situation or that situation. Um, and everywhere he goes, he goes and he aims to be a blessing to that, mm. that particular situation. Mm-hmm. And, um, and that, that really helped me at the time. And I think it's, it to me makes sense of the epigraph at the beginning um, from John 12, which, which Mark already mentioned that uh, corn of the wheat, except a corn of the wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Sorry for the King James there. I guess that's... Uh, or no, you're the, the authorized version, I suppose, we should, we should call it. Um, yeah, the sense, of, the sense of the need to sort of give up your own grand plans and schemes for life yeah. in order to be present to the people around you and by doing that, um, this doesn't give uh, away the end. Um, Al- Alyosha sees fruit; he sees good things mm-hmm. come of this, and mm-hmm. um, and other people really are benefited from the way that he is self-sacrificial in the in the novel. And it's interesting; I've not really made that link before, but until you're saying this, um, he, the concept of monastic life is all based on that self-sacrifice and you have to submit to your elder Mm -hmm. who then has I guess total authority to be able to tell you what to do who to see where to work all of that and in some ways like you say Alyosha is wrestling with that at the beginning of the novel and does he go down that path but he's even and he massively respects his elder obviously but you're right he's also subservient to all of the other members of his family and is directed around by them or is seeking to serve them and is always kind of available at their beck and call to be able to minister to them to serve to them it's a it's maybe it's that same form of 
self-sacrifice and self-renunciation. It's just, but he's offering it to his family as yeah. well as to the elder, or he's trying to reconcile that as well. But, yeah. 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 But, and then also actually, but I do want to say Alyosha is an incredible character in his own right, because when we talk about him in that way, he can sound very passive or very mm-hmm. uninteresting. Mm-hmm. And yet he's not, he's, he's yeah. the, he's the hero of the novelist Dostoevsky says, and I think yeah. he's worthy of that heroic status. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And he's not painted as this pure, you know, angel of, no. you know, peace and uh-huh. justice and all that. Um, again, it's a psychological novel. You get to know Alyosha too, and you get to know the mm-hmm. struggles of a person who is trying to follow Jesus. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, yeah. It's it's uh it's it's just it's just really well done. Mark, any parting words? Enjoy it, read it. It's it's phenomenal. Yeah, um, I hope you enjoy it as much as I have. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks, uh, thanks, Mark. And if you would like to see more videos with Mark, let us know in the comments. Um, He's got, I see a whole bunch of books back there. I'm sure he's got another one that we can, <laughs> that we can talk about. Um, uh, we uh, are dependent on giving, and there's multiple ways of doing that. You can check in the description to sort of see how um, you can give to sort of support the channel, support the Sanctus Institute. Um, thank you. Initially, one of the ways that you can uh, support us is by liking, subscribing, sharing these three videos with your any group that you're involved in um whether it's a church or just a a reading circle that you're in uh that would be not only helpful for us we really do hope that it's that it's helpful for you all uh so we will see you again and uh say goodbye once more mark goodbye everyone thanks for tuning in See ya.